So the uh, homework tonight is the yellow. We're going to do a bunch together first, but the homework is the yellow. Okay, so looking at the first problem in the yellow, uh, let me explain how FRQs work. So let me borrow notebook here. This is okay, the EP test comes in a booklet. So when you open the booklet, it's like this. You see two pages at a time. Uh, the way the FRQs are laid out in the booklet is they'll have right here this information. <coughs> That's the beginning of the FRQ. And then it'll have part A, part B, part C, part D. So uh, sometimes just A, B, and C. So like this is the information and this is the question. That's how they lay out the FRQs. So as you start reading, it says the rate at which water flows out of a pipe. Uh, we are now to the point in the year where it becomes really, really important to keep separate three key words. The key words are amount, the key words are amount, rate, and rate of the rate. So it lays out just like Danica's chart. So on Danica's chart, F represents the amount of something. F prime is the rate at which the amount is changing. And then F double prime is the rate at which the rate itself is changing. Uh, very critical to keep these clearly understood as you read the problem. Uh, here it says, the rate at which water flows out of a pipe. So they're talking about a rate. <coughs> uh, units on FRQs are often required. So we have rate at which water flows from a pipe in gallons per hour is given by a differentiable function R. So that means this column is R. So what you don't want to do is make the mistake of thinking because there's no prime on R, that R belongs over here. No, the, the description clearly says R is a rate. It doesn't have to have a prime, they're just they're telling you R is a rate. Question. Now one thing you won't ever do is if they give you something like say A prime, they won't give you a symbol A prime and have it be an amount. If there is a prime, you know it's a rate or it could be a rate of a rate. Like this being R means this column would be R prime. The rate at which R itself is changing. Uh, they don't give a symbol for the amount in this reading, so just leave that blank. Question. Cool. Okay. So, keep reading. It says use the data in the table. So here to find an approximation for R prime of 12. So I'm supposed to be approximating R prime of 12. So I want to get as many answers as possible. So feel free to talk to each other. But I want you to raise your hand and be able to tell me in English, what does the symbol R prime of 12 represent? So looking for hands. So in English, what does the symbol R prime of 12 represent? Talk to each other, I want more hands. What does the symbol R prime of 12 represent? So hands up, hands up. Come on, show me your hand. Show me your hand. What does the symbol R prime of 12 mean? Cal is it um, at time equals 12, the rate of the rate is approximately like something? Perfect. No, no, it's perfect. So at time equal 12, they're asking us to find the rate of the rate. Two points for Calvin. Somebody say it differently. Hands. Somebody say it differently. Josh. Uh, the slope of the rate at time Absolutely. Uh, R is some function. So R prime definitely means the tangent slope of R at time 12. 
to for Josh. We may have a different way of saying it. Uh, see if this makes sense. They're asking us to figure out how fast is the rate itself changing at time equal 12? Because our prime is the rate at which R changes. So we're trying to figure out how fast is R changing at time equal 12. Okay, raise your hand if you have your hand raised a minute ago. Hands? Point. Okay. Questions? Awesome. Um, you need to memorize that if they're asking you to find a rate or a tangent slope from a table, you can't. That's why they say approximate. So I cannot find r prime of 12 exactly. The best I can do is approximate. So from semester one, you should be remembering that this is a tangent slope of r at time equal 12. This is the tangent slope of r at time equal 12. You approximate a tangent slope by finding a secant slope. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is to approximate this tangent slope, I'm going to find a nearby secant slope. Um, this concept is much easier to remember if it, again, makes sense to you. Like, you don't just memorize the steps, you like make sense of the words. So let's see. At time equal 12, water is flowing from the pipe at 11.4 gallons per hour. But three hours earlier, water was only flowing at 11.2 gallons per hour. And that occurred over a 12 hour, sorry, over a three hour period. So what I can deduce from all this is, during these three hours, the rate of water flow changed by 0.2 gallons per hour Oops, wrong word, letter, sorry. <coughs> and that occurred over a three hour time period. So this is a decent approximation for how fast R is changing at time equal 12. So during the three hour time period, R went up by 0.2 gallons per hour. The rate went up by 0.2 gallons per hour during a three hour time period. So this is a good approximation of how fast R is changing at time equal 12. Therefore, this is a good approximation of R prime of 12. Okay, please. Would it be a better approximation to then from seeing the sequence of 12 to 15 I agree with you that that would be a better approximation. They don't require you to do that. Okay. However, you can do this. You could say, let's just go from 12 to 15 so I'd write r prime of 12. So the rate, let's see, at time 15, the rate is 11.3. At time 12, the rate's 11.4. Uh, that's occurring again over a three hour time period. So in this case, during those three hours, the rate actually went down by 0.1. And that decrease occurred over a three hour time period. So that's also, a, oops, don't forget the negative, that would lose a point. That's also a good approximation for how fast the rate is changing at time equal 12. Here. Elena, too um, crowded. Do we need to just have one of those? Or like, like, like so what Abby said is correct. Like if you were to average these two, it would be a better approximation, but they don't require it. So you can either do the green or the blue, doesn't matter. Either one is fine. No preference. Two for length. Please, John. So this is just like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Right. Because we're finding, remember, no, it's perfect. Okay, everybody. It just goes back to understanding the meaning, not memorizing a formula, but understanding the meaning. This is a table of r. r prime means tangent slope of r. We approximate the tangent slope of r by finding the secant slope. And that's all this is, is the old y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So two for job. Other question? Please. So um, we would leave the green equation as a negative though? Yes, because in this case, from time 12 to time 15, 
the rate definitely went down. So my best guess is that starting at time 12, the rate's starting to go down. So my estimation is, hey, at time 12, seems like the rate's going down by about, about 0.1 gallons per hour every three hours. So it's really a matter of perspective. It's like saying, well, we don't really know how fast the rate is changing at 12. So we could assume that, well, in the three hours prior, the rate was going up. <laughs> so maybe at time 12, the rate's still going up. So that's a good estimate. But if we look at the three hours after, the rate went down. So it's also a good estimate to say this is how the rate is changing at 12. That's why they accept either one. Two for Sydney. Anybody else? Please. You could, they just, they don't require it, so don't yeah. do it. Yeah, they don't want you to do that. This is good enough. Now you could do this. So a third option is say, well, let's just go all the way from 9 to 15. So we'd say R prime of 12 is approximately, let's see, during this time period, the rate went up. They require you to show the computations. That's why you have to write down this part. Oh, that's 15, sorry. So another assumption, like I was saying to Sydney, is you could say, well, during the six hour time period, you know, 12 is right in the middle of that time period. During that time period, the rate went up again. So they're all just estimates. We don't really know how fast the rate is changing at time 12, but any of these three answers is valid. Any of them. So questions? Okay, don't do all three, just pick one of them. Um, key things. You have to show the computation. So you must show this or this or this. If you do not, you will lose a point. You have to have the correct units in your final result. Uh, otherwise, you lose a point. However, if you do not want to do anything after this, like you don't need to pick up your calculator and figure out that this turns out to be, uh, let's see, 0.067. This is a correct answer, but you don't need to do this. Uh, you don't want to. Uh, doing one more step, you just risk typing something in wrong. So just stop here and you get full credit. Questions? <coughs> Perfect. Um, this is an example of an actual AP question given long ago, uh, 20 years, 1999. They have not given a question that had this kind of format for a long, long time. What they've done instead is they've given <coughs> one that looks like this one, the next one in your packet. So raise your hand and tell me what's different between the problem we just did versus this problem. Yeah, this one's asking for R prime of 7, the other asked for R prime of 12, but there's a bigger difference. Hands up. Come on, who sees the difference? What was like the table is exactly the same. One asks for R prime of 12, the other R prime of 7. What's the major difference between the two? More people can see it than that. What's the major difference between where they ask for R prime of 12? You can talk to each other. What's the key difference between they're asking for R prime of 12 versus R prime of 7? There's no R of 7. Oh, yeah. well, heads up. Uh, What's the key difference? Okay. Um, that seven is not the graph. Right. So here, well, I can just show on this one. So 12 was one of the items in the table. So that gave us three options. We could find, as we showed, the secant <coughs> slope prior to 12, the secant slope after 12, or the secant slope that kind of jumps over 12. 
they haven't given a problem like that for 15 years. Um, more recently, they give this format, and they do this a lot. Like most AP tests will have about two questions that are kind of like this. Here, there's only one option. If I'm trying to find how fast the rate is changing at seven, all I can do is <coughs> compare what's happening near seven. <coughs> I don't have any other option. So it actually makes it easier for you because all you can do is say, well, during the three hour time period that includes time seven, the rate is definitely going up. The rate's going from 10.8 gallons per hour to 11.2. And that's occurring over a three hour time period so this is my approximation for how fast R is changing at 7. So again, R prime means how fast is R changing at 7. The rate is going up by 0.4 gallons per hour every hour. Question? So that, but the units, is not gallons per hour, it's just gallons, of, like gallons per hour over 3 hours? Uh, two for Josh. I want everyone to answer this. Like, look at the board. Uh, really key. It's it's really it's really really helpful if the units like you don't just kind of write down the units, but you read them and they make sense to you. So R is a rate. It's so many gallons per hour at which water flows from some. This is the on type. Yeah. This is an awesome pipe. Um, <laughs> really good. Um, so you have this pipe, right? Water is flowing. I can feel it. Um, water is flowing from the pipe at 9.6 gallons every hour. That's actually quite slow. It's like you have a 10 gallon bucket and you stand there for a, an hour before the bucket fills. Okay, 9.6 gallons per hour. It's coming out really slow. This is telling us how fast the rate, you know, how does the rate change? So it's saying the rate's going to go up from 11, you know, whatever it is, it's going to go up by 0.4 gallons per hour. Well, how long will it take for that rate to go up by that much? Three hours. So yeah, this, our prime, has to be units of gallons per hour per hour. Would that help? Yeah. Two more. Questions? So the units for the rate are just gallons per hour. And then the units of our prime are gallons per hour per hour. It's back to this table. Um, these are really good questions, too, for Chris. It's really simple. Everybody look at the table. Look. There's a very distinct pattern. And if you just keep track of the pattern, you'll never lose the unit points. Um, they're telling us that capital R is a rate. And they tell us the units of this rate are gallons per hour. As soon as they do that, you right away know what these units are and you know what these units are. So hands up, what are these units? Come on, hands. Because this is telling you how fast this changes. So what must the units of this be if this is telling you how fast this is changing. So Chris, what are the units here? Just gallons. Just gallons. Because this is how fast this changes. So this is changing by so many gallons per hour. R refers to how fast this changes. How many do it? Two points, three for Chris. What units belong here? Remember, this would be the symbol R prime. So what units go here? Tori? Either way, Tori. Either way is fine. So this is gallons per hour every hour. It's, it's a very distinct pattern. This is gallons. This is the rate at which this changes. Therefore, this must be gallons per hour. This is the rate at which this changes. So this is gallons per hour every hour. So how many do it? One. Two for Tori. Awesome. Cool, next one. Okay, 
Okay, I want you to put this list somewhere in your notes or yellow pocket. Um, in this unit, we are learning several reasons why you would want to use an integral to find something. In the buff pocket, we practiced using integrals to find the displacement of moving objects. Displacement meaning how much did the position of the object change? In the buff packet, we also used integrals to find the total distance traveled by the object. And then we also used the fundamental theorem to rearrange, well, we took the fundamental theorem to figure out like where is the object. So in the buff packet, we used integrals for three different reasons. <coughs> Displacement, total distance, and finding the position of a particle. <coughs> Those were all reasons for using an integral. Um, in this packet, well, pink packet, we learned that you could use an integral to find an area on a graph. And then in the yellow packet, we're going to now do an example of where we use an integral to find the average value of something. Okay? So you don't have to, like, have this list memorized, but it's really helpful if you can keep straight in your head that hey, we're using integrals for different reasons. Like, why are we doing the integral? Then, once we know why we're doing the integral, we have to have a method for actually calculating the integral. And in the buff packet, that method was always a Riemann sum. In the pink packet, that method was always your calculator. Uh, this yellow packet will go back and forth. Some problems will ask you to find the integral using a Riemann sum. Some problems will ask you to find the integral using a calculator. So. But keep those two columns separate. There's a reason why you need an integral, and then there's a method for actually calculating the integral. Question? Awesome. So back to the yellow. Okay, so. In FRQ, this part doesn't change. All that changes is the question. So the question says, approximate the average rate at which water is flowing out of the pipe during the 24-hour period. So here we have different rates at different times. This is saying find the average of these rates. Okay, find the average of those rates. Now, everybody in this room, uh, years ago, I don't know exactly how many, but it's probably been several, you learned a method for finding the average of a bunch of values. Um, just raise your hand and tell me what's that method. And don't overthink it, this is simple. Like, you learned long ago that if you have several different values and you want to find the average, what do you do? Hands up, come on. You have several different values. Yeah, don't overthink it. Y'all look at each other like this in the trip. Um, Christian. He's out of all the values and divide it by how many values there are. Yeah, how many do it? 0.2 for Christian. Okay. So a valid way of finding an average is to add up what you have, divide by how many. So look at these. Don't grab your calculator. Don't talk to anybody. Just raise your hand if you can just kind of at a glance give me a rough estimate of what the average of all those different rates might be. Hands come Like if the rates, all these different values, what's what's a decent guess? Lots of different answers here. It's just a guess. Like what's what's a what's a ballpark estimate for the average of all those different numbers? Like what's a what's a decent average, Luke? Ten and a half. Ten and a half. Make sense? Okay, point. Um, look at me, everybody. Okay, I do think it is very valuable to be able to do that. So look at your list and say, okay, average of all those I should be somewhere around 10 and a half. So if I get an answer of 106, I know I've done something wrong. Fair? Like it doesn't even fit. It's got to be, you know, around 10-ish, okay? But in calculus, they'll never ask you to find an average by just adding them up and dividing. That's not invalid, that's just they won't accept that as a method. The method they'll expect you to always use in this class for finding the average value is this formula. 
So you'll need to memorize this. So if I want to find the average of all those different values of R, the method that is required of the AP test is you must integrate whatever you are averaging If I'm trying to find the average of R, I must find the integral of R. Questions? Please. Yes. So I have to specify over what time period am I trying to find the, the average, two for average. So I'm going to go in this case, because they asked me to find the average over the 24-hour period, I'm going to start at time 0 and stop at time 24. And then, similar to the other method of calculating an average, they're very connected. We have to divide. You divide by the time period. Multiplying by 1 over 24 is the same thing as dividing by 24. So you have to have this formula memorized. When they say find the average value of r, you're like, oh, got it. I need to integrate r and then divide by the time period. Please. Huh? Two points for Josh. So that's the more general thought. Yep, it's perfect. Please, How are we going to define R? Okay, you don't know those. Awesome, two points. So that comes back to this list, Abby. That. Uh, where you go? Hold on. This one right here. Like, I know I need to do an integral because they asked me to find the average value. So I know that. So I keep reading. And sure enough, they tell me, find that average using a midpoint Riemann sum of two subintervals. So I write on my paper, let's see, I'm trying to find the average value of R. And I know from memory that this can be found by integrating R. You have to write down the integral. Many problems will give points for writing the integral down. So I've got to do that. Okay, now they're telling me this is what you're trying to find, so you need to use an integral. How do I calculate the integral? Riemann sum. So this is going to be approximately equal to, okay, do not forget the 1 over 24. Like, everybody look. That is a really common mistake. We're trying to find this. So we have to have the 1 over 24. Now we're going to compute the integral. So parentheses. Now remember, integration is not complicated. Integration is just multiply, multiply again, multiply again, add them all together. So there's no integral sign over here. Don't put an integral here. That makes no sense. We are finding this integral. How do we find an integral? We multiply and add them up. So that's what we're going to do here is multiply and add up. So we've got to multiply r and dt. Riemann sum of two subintervals. So if I'm going from 0 to 24, I want to go from 0 to 12, and then from 12 to 24. So these are my two subintervals. Question. Awesome. So I go to the first subinterval. I'm supposed to find a value of r. The value of r that I pick is the value that is in the middle of the first subinterval. That gets multiplied by the dt for the first subinterval, which would be 12. Do you need me to do anything again or say it different? Or this is review from the bottom. So. 
Please tell me, how did you get this ball? So I'm looking at the integral, and again, it's all about maintaining the equality, right? So I've got to have 1 over 24, there's the 1 over 24. The integral says I'm supposed to take these two things multiplied together repeatedly, and then the S means add them up. So I go to the first subinterval, 0 to 12, and I find the value of R that is in the middle. So R in the middle is 10.8. Now I need to multiply by dt. dt means difference in time. So for this first subinterval, the difference in time from the beginning to the <coughs> end is 12 hours. Two points. One hour. Oh. So plus, do it again. Go to the second subinterval, find the value of r that is in the middle. And then once again, multiply by dt. Well, from 12 to 24, time changes by 12. So. I need to put units. Um, I'm finding the average of R. R has units of gallons per hour, therefore the average of R will still have units of gallons per hour. Questions, or anyone want me to restate it, or say it different? Or? Please. We never order the um, like numbers like in like size, right? For example, it's the first one, it wouldn't be like 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 that one is in like the number four, but like the second one, we would have put like nine nine six at the top and put like the five nine. Does that make sense? Like if the if the rate is like changing a lot more, going up and down. No, what you might be, I could be wrong, but what you might be remembering is some unit in a previous class where they asked you to find the, the median, right, the middle value where you order them and then find the middle. No, I've never seen that come up on an AG Calc test. So we just take the data as is, leave it alone, and simply find the middle yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, because that's finding a middle as well, just for a different purpose. Yeah, midpoint ream on some means leave the data alone, go to that first 12 hours and find the very middle time, not the middle value. And we're not finding the average, just the middle Just the middle time. Now, a little confusing, but we are finding the average of R, or a average of R, but the method we're using is this integral, so it's, it's hierarchical. It's like. So it's really finding the average of the average. Not really, kind of though. <laughs> We're finding the average of, this is the best way to remember it. We're finding the average of R, how? Using an integral. At that point, forget that you're finding average. Like, oh, how do I find the integral? I only got two possibilities Riemann sum or calculator. They said Riemann sum, so I forget why I'm doing it for just a moment, and I just focus on Riemann sum. I'm like, oh, to find an integral, I've got to take these two multiplied. So which one do I use? I use the one that is in the middle. Not the middle value, just the middle. Not ordered or anything like that, just the middle, like so. That's a really good question. Two points. Yeah. Cool. Okay, key things on the AP test. You have to have the units. Uh, otherwise, you lose a point. This one, they probably won't give a point for the units because it doesn't say indicate units. I haven't spent enough time to verify that they always specify whether that's required or not. So it's safer just to get the habit of always doing it. Um, but you want to stop right here. Like, don't go any further. Don't type this in your calculator. Just stop. If you type it in your calculator, you risk typing something wrong and losing the point. If you leave it like this, they give you full credit. Questions? Please, just our answer. That is our answer. Should we leave it like that just when we're finding the average value? Oh, no. Good question. Two points. Anytime you're doing a calculator problem, and all that's left to do is like multiply, divide, add, just leave it. 
Oh, and don't go further because you you could type it in, but what if you type it wrong? They will take the point away. If you just leave it like that. They'll give you full credit. So. Two points, Steph. Um, why are we dividing uh, by like one over twenty-four for multiplying? So I'm. I'm not really taking the time to explain all of the why here. We may have time in the future. But for this class, when they say find an average, you have to integrate whatever you're trying to find the average of. The integration, remember, is you know, multiply, add, multiply, add. The adding part of that integration is taking care of kind of adding them all up. But then we have to divide by how much time it occurred over to get the average. So that's just part of finding the average. That's not really a great answer, but that's why we're doing it. So two points. Please, Justin. Is there ever going to be a point where we need to solve what we put out? Like this? Yeah. Multiple yeah. choice, yes. Or it could be an FRQ where you need a value to use in the next part of the FRQ, then you'll have to multiply it out. If not, just leave it. Okay. Yeah. Two points. For the homework, you're going to multiply it out so you can see that you have the right answer. But on the AP test, don't. Just stop. In fact, we might not. Let me look. Hold on a second. Oh, that doesn't have an answer. The, the first few problems on this packet, I call them extra examples. So there are no answers in the back for those. So we're getting those done in class. The actual problems start at number one. And those do have the answer. Anybody else? Good job. Next one. Okay, this is not, this extra example is not a, a new concept. It's just reviewing from the top. They said here's a differentiable function app. Find a right Riemann sum approximation of this integral using three sub -intervals. So every time you compute an integral, make sure you write the integral because they often give points for simply writing the integral. Okay, so I'm trying to find the value of that integral. Well, I'm supposed to find this integral using a right Riemann sum using three subintervals. So from negative three to three would be one subinterval. Three to nine, and then nine to fifteen. Uh, in this case, they were a little vague. They didn't say three equal, um, but they really should have. So. Um, Technically, they don't say three equals subintervals. You can do whatever you want. They have to give you credit. Yeah, they should have said three equal. I believe I'm the one who made that mistake, so my fault. When I created the extra example, I forgot to put equals. So I go to the first subinterval. I need to find a value of f in the first subinterval. It is supposed to be the value of f that is on the right of the first subinterval. So please raise your hand and tell me what goes here. Hands, come on. All of you should see it. Look at the paper, talk to each other, raise your hand. What goes here? I'm finding this integral. I go to the first subinterval. I've got to take f multiplied by dt. So I've got to take this times this. So what goes in this box? First subinterval, right Riemann sum, Lauren. So I go to the first subinterval. On the right hand side of the first subinterval, the value of f is 1. So this is 1. Who knew it? Hands. Show me. Point 0.2 for Lauren. Hands up. What goes in this box? I should say those parentheses. Hands. What goes in that set of parentheses? Come on, hands. What goes in the parentheses? Coaching. How many agree? Point 0.2 for coaching. Anyone need, need me to talk about it more? Please. I just have a question. Yeah, so please. On the last one, you said to just stop. Could, do you have to put the value of the velocity, or could you put the v of 3? Oh, outstanding. Hold on. 
The seek, like I didn't even know what the secret questions are, I'll be honest. I just know when you ask it, my brain just like fires and it goes, oh, that is such an important question. Just, and it's based on experience. Like, I, here's why it's so important, by the way. Listen carefully, hey. This is why that third question is so important. Um, let's keep going for a second and I'll get back to it. So what's the next two numbers? Hands up, come on. What comes next? Hands. What's next? What goes here? Let's go, Sarah. One is six. One times six again. Because I'm in the second subinterval on the right, the value of f is one. How many knew it? Point two for Sarah. Next two hands. Next two. So Justin. How many agree? Point two for Justin. Okay, I'm getting back to Kylie's question. On the FRQ section, you stop here. Yeah, don't go further. That's full credit. Um, questions? Now here's Kylie's comments. This is why she got the ticket. If you're thinking about, you know, you're doing this integral and what you wrote was this. So we're taking f of 3 at, you know, times 6. You can't stop there. Like the f of 3, they expect you to go figure out what f of 3 is. So that's kind of an exception. Good question. Please. So like, you said that if you were to solve it all out, it would still be the right answer, but you'd just leave it there to um, make sure you don't make mistakes. Yes, yeah. There's nothing wrong with going further other than it does risk a mistake. And if I go further and I'm just accidentally, you know, I do this, they take away the point. It's like they, instead of, like this probably would have been worth two points. One point for showing your work correctly, and then the second point for having the right number. I mean, that seems kind of weird, but they actually give you two points for that. If you go one step further, you only get one of the two. So it's totally um, acceptable to have a like kind of broad answer. The rule is if all that's left to do is either just add, subtract, multiply, divide, or just kind of some algebra, you can stop. Uh, you can stop if it says sine of pi. You don't have to even do the unit circle stuff. You just stop. And I'll keep reminding you, like problem after problem that we do together in class, I'll just keep saying, no, nope, stop here. If you're in the homework and you're unsure, just ask me. So if you really want that habit, it, it makes you go through the test faster. There's like less to do. Second, it just less risk of a mistake. So yeah, it's really smart to always just stop. So okay. Go to number one, please. Okay, one same description, that's how all FRQs are laid out, so you don't have to keep reading the description. Just go to the question. The rate of water flow can be approximated by this formula Q of T. Okay, what you are seeing in this FRQ is extremely common. It has happened many, many times over many, many years. They'll give a table. The table shows values of R. They tell you R is a rate. Then they say, oh, we could also approximate R with this equation. So basically, they're telling you R and Q are the same thing. One small difference. R is like measured. Like they took the pipe, and they went out, and at hour three, they measured. How fast is the water flowing? And then they wrote it down. Once they had the table, they handed this to a mathematician or engineer, and the engineer created an equation that pretty much produces this table. Like if you put this in your calculator and make a table, your table won't be an exact copy, but pretty close. So that's why these are basically the same thing. That's gonna happen a lot on the AP test, so if that doesn't make sense, you talk now. Okay? One's just the table, one's an equation, but they're roughly the same. <coughs> it says use Q of T, so don't use this. 
to approximate the average rate of water flow. Well, Q is the rate at which water flows. So there are lots of different values of Q. They want the average of Q this time. So I write in my paper, the average of Q of T, I remember the formula. I need to integrate Q. They want the average over the 24 hour time period. I cannot forget that I must divide by the time period. So that's what you write on your paper. This time, because they're saying they want, so they want us to find the, the average rate of water flow. That means they want the average of Q. This can be done on my calculator because I have a formula. So I pick up my calculator, I run it through the calculator. It turns out to be 10.785, I believe. And it says include units of measure. Well, I am finding the average of the water flow. So the rate of water flow is gallons per hour. So the average of the water flow would be gallons per hour. And like we did a few minutes ago, this is reasonable. Like it makes sense looking at the data that this would be a reasonable average of those numbers. So, please. How did we get 10.785? That when you pick up your calculator and do this on your calculator, just like the pink packet. Okay, you plug in Q. Plug in Q, because here's your formula for Q. Okay. So what you'll end up doing is put this in Y1, and then just do the integral of Y1. This is just part of your calculator, remember? So you're going to do dx, but... Well done. Well done. Homework is the yellow, so...